Happy Friday. Happy Friday. <clears throat> I actually do not have anything at the top for you, so why don't Good. we get straight to what's on your mind? Okay, I, I just have a brief one. I realize that the president has already spoken to this, um, but that was before the House actually passed this legislation, and of course, we all know that it is the State Department where this review of Keystone resides now. So the, my question is, does this vote and a potential similar vote in the Senate uh, have any effect on the review that is currently underway? No, it does not. Uh, we are continuing to move ahead uh, with our thorough, transparent, and objective review of the Keystone Pipeline application and in accordance with the executive order. This review includes consideration of many factors, including energy security, environmental, cultural, and economic impacts, foreign policy, and compliance with review law and policy. As you know, there were a couple of factors, including the Nebraska court case, as well as the number of public comments uh, that led us to make a decision about delaying that earlier this spring. Certainly on any decision about legislation, we refer to the White House. Right. But is it the administration's view that the State Department process, this review process, can be circumvented by the Congress? Well, the State Department process is continuing. Uh, obviously, if there's a decision made uh, by the President on legislation, uh, we'll proceed from there. No, but as a general principle, do you think that they, that, 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 that Congress can, le can legislate approval of something like this? Well, there's a process in place for a reason, um, but I'm not going to parse the legislation and what may or may not be done about it any further. Well, Okay. My frustration with this is that I'm not asking you to parse the legislation. I'm asking mm -hmm. for the administration's view of whether Congress can legislate approval of something like this. And I'm pointing you to the White House for any further comment on the legislation. But, but okay. Uh, and the review stands where? It's ongoing, as and I mentioned. With still no well, anticipated. Uh, as I, as you know, but I point into this, but since we haven't talked about this in a while, there's, as you know, litigation pending in the Nebraska Supreme Court that could ultimately impact the pipeline route in that state, and that in turn could affect the assessment of the permit application. So we've been monitoring those developments. We've also been using uh, additional time allotted uh, to agencies con to continue reviewing and considering the unprecedented number of new public comments. Obviously the court case uh, and the findings of a court case, which we don't have any control over, uh, could impact. Right. Are you still getting public comments? Yeah, no, there's that's no. That's finished. Yeah. Correct, correct. But we've obviously taken the time to continue to uh, review those. The permit process will conclude uh, once factors that could have a significant impact on the department's national security, national interest determination regarding the proposed project have been evaluated and appropriately reflected in the decision documents. But obviously, the court case has an impact on that. We don't have any control over the timing of that. And have you been in contact with um, your counterparts in Canada about this legislation, or are you just waiting? to see if it pl how it plays out in the Congress. Uh, I don't have anything to read out from here. I think that would take place in the White House. If in that the did. administration's view, is it wise for a legislative body to try to interrupt or to supersede the review that the State Department is doing now? Well, I, I think my colleague over at the White House spoke to this a couple of days ago before the vote, which is fair, and said that in the past we haven't looked fondly on efforts to uh, circumvent the process in place. Fondly. Yes. Dim view. A dim view. Okay. I wasn't an exact quote, it was right. a paraphrase. Uh, Do you have any more in no. Okay. No. Can we go to Israel? Israel? Sure. Um, I wanted to ask about the meetings that the Secretary held yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, there was a press conference afterwards at which he said that there has been. They'd agreed some steps to de-escalate the tensions in the region. Today, out of the region, they're saying that the. Um, uh, Palestinians have all, all restrictions have been lifted on men wanting to go and pray mm -hmm. at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Um, I just wondered what it was. Uh, first off, if the the your reaction to the news that today it seems to be uh, free movement into the mosque for Palestinian worshippers or Arab worshippers, I guess. And um, then secondly, what it is that you're asking the Palestinians to do to do de-escalate te tensions. Well, let me talk about this a little bit, and as you mentioned, the Secretary spoke about it. I will mention one thing at the top just to manage expectations. One of the discussions they had was the fact that we were not going to announce on their behalf any steps, specific steps they were going to take, and we feel it's much more important that they take steps than it is that it's publicly announced. But I can talk a little bit more about 
the meetings. Um, as you mentioned uh, last night, the secretary had the opportunity to sit down with leaders, have these discussions in person. Uh, the parties, as he mentioned, the parties uh, agreed to take affirmative steps to restore calm and implement practical measures to prevent further escalation of tensions. Uh, obviously, you saw uh, the lift on age uh, limit restrictions for Muslim men entering the Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount. This is an important development, one we certainly welcome, and a positive step toward maintaining the status quo of the site. Uh, 40,000 Muslims were able to visit the site today, and although tensions remain high, this is a positive step. Uh, they also, during these meetings, um, uh, President, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu strongly reaffirmed Israel's commitment to uphold the status quo, and you've seen some of those actions. And President Abbas restated his firm commitment on to nonviolence uh, and made it clear that he will do everything possible to restore calm. Now, the situation is still very tense. Uh, we have our eyes open. We will remain engaged and in touch with the leaders. Um, and of course, actions by the parties going forward are the key to restoring uh, and maintaining calm. So on the, on the Palestinian side, one of the issues that we've seen has been this spate of sort of lone attacks, either by car rammings or stabbings or, or you know, um, incidents of that, such ilk. Could you tell us what it is you are hoping that the Palestinians will be able to do to avoid those kind of actions taking place in the, in the future? Well, uh, obviously, as I just mentioned, President Abbas made it clear that he is uh, willing to do everything possible to restore calm. Broadly, in the discussion, they talked about a range of areas, including access to holy sites, security for holy sites, coordination among security forces and authorities, regional security architecture, uh, incitement and settlements. Those are a, a number of the pool of areas that obviously need to be uh, addressed. Um, and uh, I think the fact that uh, there was a commitment to take affirmative steps, we obviously uh, feel is positive. Now, of course, the proof is not in the words. The proof is in the actions. Uh, so we'll see what happens over the next couple of days, but we're just not going to uh, get into more specific details. And you mentioned that you, the proof is in the actions, mm -hmm. clearly, but you've only cited one action, and that was on the part of the Israelis to open up, to drop the age restriction. Have you seen any affirmative action from the Palestinians to li to do what um, President Abbas said that he well, was Well, Matt, obviously doing? these discussions happened last night, and we certainly yeah. anticipate that there will be in the coming days. Right, but there was a, I mean, there was pretty quick and demonstrable action taken by the Israelis. I'm just wondering if you saw any quick and demonstrable action taken. There's public and private taken. actions, but I don't have anything more All specific. Right. We'll see what happens in the next couple of Is days. Is it... <sighs> I, I'm not sure I understand why you think that it is um, wise to announce that uh, the two sides of, or that three sides have agreed to steps to calm things down and then to keep them secret. It seems to me that this is exactly the way the peace talks collapsed by you and them trying to keep everything secret, which only leads to all sorts of speculation and tempers flaring based on inaccurate speculation and information and flat out erroneous uh, you know er erroneous reports that are driven by people with agendas that you that, with the uh, I don't want to use the word extremist but people with agendas to try and disrupt or continue the continue the, the uh, continue the, the conflict well, Matt, I, I, I just it, 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 it doesn't make any sense to me that you wouldn't want them, uh, that you wouldn't, that you would want these alleged steps that were agreed to to become public. That way, people know what to expect. Well, we sent a strong message that there were there was an agreement to take affirmative steps in order to uh, hopefully generate some calm uh, in the region. There was an evaluation and discussion made by all the parties involved that this was the best way to proceed. Right, but that was, there was an evaluation and discussion made by all parties involved when they agreed over a year ago that they would get a deal by the, by within, within a year's time or within nine, within nine months' time. And look where that is. Nowhere. Well, uh, we still have no regrets about how we handled or how we managed the process last year either. Uh, Go ahead uh, and say. Uh, very quickly. Uh, what, what would be the demonstrable and quick action by the Palestinians that you would like to see? I'm not going to spell it out further, Said, other than to convey that 
President Abbas, uh, Abbas made clear that he'll do everything possible to restore calm. He restated his firm commitment to nonviolence. They talked about a range of issues uh, that both sides can work on, uh, including regional security structure, uh, coordination among security forces, incitement, settlements, a lot of the issues that have been causing tensions but in the you, region. When you, when you go through it, you'll find that he's only able to sort of uh, demonstrably and quickly uh, sort of lower the level of incitement because he, the, the Palestinians have no control over East Jerusalem or any part to sort of, you know, the, dissuade the public from going out and, and demonstrating and burning tires and throwing stones and so on. Well, so he you, committed to the secretary. He was going to do everything he could to restore calm. Okay. I'm not going to get now into I more detail. I know that you from this podium and, of course, the secretary in his press conference emphasized that it was really most of the, they were focused, as you suggested, on what's going on in Jerusalem. But also, he mentioned, you know, a, at the end of, of one uh, statement or one question, that, you know, the, uh, the talks and restarting the, the talks and going back to the talks. Could you give us a broader picture or maybe a clearer picture on uh, what future is there for these talks? Well, it remains the case that there won't be long-term peace and stability without a two-state solution. But mm -hmm. I can. there's no plans uh, to restart the peace talks. Uh, right now we're focused on reducing tensions and creating a climate where it may be possible to address the underlying causes of the conflict in the future. That was the focus also, of their discussion. And also the uh, Foreign Minister of Jordan, Nasser Judah, uh, said or suggested that they will not send back the, their ambassador until they see on the ground. So with the action today, the Israelis allowing 40,000 worshippers of all ages, as a matter of fact, to go into the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the kind of action uh, that should give incentive to the Jordanians now to send their ambassador? We'll, we'll let Jordan make that decision, but I certainly can, can convey to you that, of course, diplomatic relations between Israel and Jordan are critical, given the two nations share security challenges and economic opportunities, mm -hmm. and the importance, of course, of the jo Jordan-Israel Treaty of Peace and Jordan's special role in Jerusalem's Muslim holy places. Uh, the Secretary spoke with King Abdullah about this yesterday and about Jordan's decision to withdraw its ambassador to Tel Aviv and how tensions can be reduced going forward, but we'll, we'll let them make decisions and, moving and forward. Finally, anything uh, new or an update regarding the uh, Palestinian efforts in the UN? I don't have yeah. anything new to report on that front. Go ahead. So did, did you raise the issue of the um, um, continuing um, settlement activities, and, and do you think that um, any, any freeze of this activity will actually be helpful in maintaining calm and stability for, for a while? Well, as I mentioned, that was one of the topics that was discussed. Um, obviously, as we've also stated here before, uh, you know, we believe that the, uh, you know, ongoing settlement activity or construction in East Jerusalem is contrary to the stated goal of achieving a two-state solution, and that continues to be our view. But there are a range of factors at play here. That's not the only factor. So what was, did you get a clear reaction or, or a commitment from the Israeli I side I think as this? I stated earlier, I'm not going to lay out more further uh, what, where they'll go from here. Uh, just a couple brief mm -hmm. things on this. Um, you, a lot has been made about the incitement or alleged incitement coming from the Palestinian side, and the, mm -hmm. uh, I'm just wondering, in view of the last questions about settlement activity and construction in East Jerusalem, does the administration regard Israeli announcements of these kinds of things as incitement? I'm not going to put a new label on it other than to convey it's contrary to the stated goal of achieving a two-state solution right, and contrary the, to what they want to achieve. But do you believe that contributes to the, to, to, the, tension? to the tension and also can spark uh, protests, some of which turn, turn, turn violent? Certainly contributes to the tension, yes. Uh, Obviously, there are a range of factors at the same time that are in play contributing to the tension. Secondly, are, are you disappointed that you didn't get a firm commitment from the Jordanians to return their ambassador? I think the Secretary felt they had a good discussion about it. Obviously, Jordan will make their own decision. I think the foreign right. minister spoke to this yesterday a little bit, too. Right. He said that it would depend on whether Israel actually does what it says it's going to do. Mm -hmm. But is it your understanding that if Israel, that if the Israelis actually follow through on whatever it was, the secret steps that Prime Minister Netanyahu pledged to take, that the Jordanians will return their ambassador. We'll is that see your that. understanding? I, that I would you point you know. to the foreign minister's right. comments, but I don't have anything more and to say. And then lastly, I've got two brief ones on something mm -hmm. you said yesterday. You were asked about the home, home demolitions. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what you had a brief line that you said uh, punitive demolitions are counterproductive to the cause of peace and exacerbate already 
um, tense, uh, an already tense situation. I, I, I'm wondering, the, do you regard that, uh, the, these home demolitions as, you didn't say this, but some have interpreted it to mean that you believe that these home demolitions constitute collective punishment? I didn't convey that. I think right. they're one of the factors that contribute to tension. So there are some in Israel who, who, who read that, who took what you said yesterday and said flat out that you had condemned what, what uh, collective punishment and that these, you condemned the housing de demolitions as collective punishment. That is incorrect. I said, I said as you just quoted, they were counterproductive. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> meanwhile, hold on, I just get, because I want to ask now about Egypt mm -hmm. and home demolitions. Because yesterday, or early this week, there were a bunch, the Egyptian um, government demolished uh, several hundred homes mm -hmm. uh, in the Sinai. Do you take the same view of, of those home demolitions as uh, you do of um, the Israeli demolitions? Well, every as I, as we often as I often like to say, every situation is different, Matt. And as you know, there have been some serious security challenges in the Sinai. We respect Egypt's concern about their security in the area and support its right to self-defense. We also expect that uh, they will ensure the rights of those being displaced are respected and that they are adequately compensated. Uh, that continues to be what we have conveyed to the Egyptians. So you don't regard that as being counterproductive to the cause of uh, peace or fighting extremism, uh, these home demolitions? Well, there, it's an entirely different scenario right, on that. But, you, but you, would, you would not argue that, I mean, you say that, that, that there are serious security problems in the Sinai for the Egyptians. Are there not also serious uh, security concerns and security problems for the Israelis? Well, they're not, Egypt is not predetermining uh, what borders would be uh, by taking these steps. It's well, a different scenario. Oh, I understand it's a different scenario, but it's the same tactic, as it were, to fight what is believed to be by a government to be a terrorism With or With entirely extremism. different context. Yeah, yeah, but it, it, it's not okay for the Israelis to demolish homes, but it's okay for the Egyptians to uh, demolish it's, homes? Is we believe it's counterproductive to their stated goals. In Egypt, we understand their concerns about their security. We've seen recent threats to that in the Sinai, as you all have uh, reported on. I think I'm going to leave it at that. They're different scenarios. Go ahead. Quickly follow up on something that Matt said on, okay. on the issue of the settlement. You may not consider it incitement, but you do consider provocations, correct? I said there are a but range of factors that contribute to the tension, Saeed. Let to me be finish. A provocative action, correct? I'm not going to uh, have you put words in my mouth. I'm going to leave it at what I just conveyed. With, let's say, uh, statements by Naftali Bennett, uh, a cabinet member, yesterday, only made yesterday, that he actually killed many Arabs and there was no problem with that. Is that an incitement? I'm not going to put further labels on it, Saeed. We speak of, out against issues when we have okay. concerns. I just mentioned, let me finish, yeah. that settlements is one of the discussion, one of the topics that was discussed. And, and on the home de demolitions, mm -hmm. since uh, Israel, if, if it says someone is, is a terrorist, they kill him or whatever, and they go afterward to demolish the home, which is really punishing the family, and, you know, these families are quite large, that wouldn't be considered uh, collective punishment? I think I just uh, gave an answer to that question. Go ahead, Samir. Are you on this topic or a new topic? On well, the meeting with the Prime Minister, sure. Mr. Do you mm -hmm. know if the Secretary uh, briefed Prime Minister Netanyahu about his meetings with the Iranian Foreign Minister in Oman and the talks with Iran? Uh, they did uh, talk about Iran um, as well, uh, and of course the ongoing discussions uh, that are happening and will reconvene next week. The Secretary mm -hmm. made it clear that our position has not changed and that we're working close uh, to close off all possible pathways to a nuclear weapon for Iran in order to ensure the peace and security of the international community, including Israel. And we will continue uh, to uh, keep all of our friends and allies informed of what uh, we are going, into doing, going to be doing in the days ahead. Thank you. Any more on this topic or uh, on this? Oh, on this topic. Okay. And Joe, you too? Okay, go ahead. When you were talking about the issues discussed, it's, you mentioned the expression, pool of ideas need to be uh, addressed. Need to be addressed. I mean, you mean the regional security and different issues related to the conflict, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Are these issues part of the deal or an agreement or there is a mechanism to do it or the first thing is to, is just to to lower the tense between the two parties. So just so I make sure I understand your question, are you talking about the topics I referenced that yes. were discussed? Yes. 
those are the topics that we've all seen have contributed to the tensions on the ground. So it's natural they were discussed okay. as a part of the meetings. Obviously, it's important that both sides agreed to take affirmative steps. We'll see, though. Ac it's not words. It's actions that matter. Um, I wouldn't call it a deal. I would call it, you know, an agreement by both sides to take positive steps to reduce tensions. And that certainly is separate from, as I mentioned, any effort to restart a peace process. So it's so there, there is first to handle the situation now and then to take care of these issues and then peace process. Well, our, our focus is on reducing tensions. Now. There's no plans to restart um, the peace talks at this point in time. On, uh, another issue, the Baghdadi message, uh, alleged the one, first, can you confirm the authenticity of the message? And, and second, do you have any reaction to uh, the... Uh, threats he made and his his message in general? I, I spoke to this yesterday in terms of his message in general. Um, I don't have any confirmation or, or I can't authenticate um, the uh, calls or the comments just like I couldn't yesterday. And just to reiterate what I said yesterday, uh, it should come as no surprise that an organization like ISIL would be putting out these type of threatening um, rhetoric uh, that's conveying and calling for more brutality. Uh, and it's a, just a reminder of the threat that uh, the group poses to the region, but I don't have any... But so uh, you take these threats seriously? Well, I, I think it's not new. Uh, I don't know about taking seriously. As you know, we're, uh, we're implementing a, an aggressive uh, military campaign with a number of other components to go after ISIL. That hasn't changed since yesterday, regardless of whether we can authenticate these comments. I just wanted to, sorry, I just wanted to back to Israel just very oh, briefly. Oh, sure. Sorry, Joe, go ahead. No, it's okay. I just wanted very quickly, you keep saying that, or you, you said that we will see whether these steps are implemented. Did Was there any kind of understanding about a time frame within which these steps would be implemented? Was that something that you discussed with the leaders? I think, obviously, it's important that they happen soon in the coming days. We'll see what happens. Um, but some of these pieces uh, will be up to them to, to of course, implement. I mean, it's just, it goes back to sort of Matt's question about why not lay out um, what it was that you agreed. Um, for instance, I know it's a different situation, but when we had the Syria chemical weapons, um, the Secretary Kerry and Foreign Minister Lavrov came out and laid out a plan and a timeline, and in some ways that was kind of helpful, I guess, for the international community. Because there's sort of always a decision made through diplomatic channels on what's most appropriate. At that, For that scenario, we felt it would be effective to communicate publicly. We certainly understand the appetite for that. It's not a misunderstanding of that. We've already seen uh, one step. Uh, taken. We'll see how things proceed. But it's here. also a question of accountability, of holding the two sides to their commitments that they made. If if you know what they are, uh, but nobody else does, nobody in the wider, and I'm not even talking about the press, I'm talking about the Israeli and Palestinian communion, uh, community know what they are. How do those communities and the Arab world in general hold, uh, have a, how can they hold the leaders accountable for for what well, you it's say clear what what's happening on the ground now and the level of tensions, the level of violence, the level of um, rhetoric is something that needs to change. I think we'll be able to evaluate, as will people in the region, whether there's a change to that. Yeah, but they can't. This is the problem. And I get back to you. You, you, you say you understand there's an appetite for it. The appetite is not particularly for us wanting to know just so we can know. It's for the people whose lives are affected by this. They'll, if they don't know, if I'm a Palestinian who wants to go to... Uh, Al Aqsa and worship. I, I want to know if I'm going to be able to get in, get in there. Well, the I want to know if, and if I'm who went an to Israeli. Today certainly no, don't they? Well, right. But if I'm an Israeli, I want to know what what uh, President Abbas said that he was going to do about mm -hmm. uh, about incitement. I want to know if I'm a Palestinian. I want to know what the Israelis are going to do about you know checkpoints and things like that. Uh, you know, keeping it secret means that. They don't. They're, 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 there's no. There's no. They don't have to do it. It's a question of accountability. If you keep, they just took someone, a step. It doesn't mean that's they don't have one to do step. It. But, and as I said, they'll be taking additional steps. But we don't know what they are, so we can't know if they if they don't follow through on them. Well, you'll just have to see in the coming days. Okay, can I just ask one, one mm -hmm. more? Sorry, uh, uh, I, uh, this is just to clear it up. I guess there mm -hmm. was some reporting that um, during the meetings there was a phone call in from Sisi or a phone call to uh, President Sisi. Can you just clarify if that was the case and which meeting and um, what, what was said? It's a very good question. I didn't have a chance to talk about that level of specificity. Okay. I know there have been different 
versions of the report. So let me get a little more clarity for okay. you on kind of when that call happened, Thank you. which I believe so, it sorry, did. Jen, very quickly, but you always talked about you know maintaining the status quo ante, uh, things as they were. But the Israelis uh, are introducing metal detectors you know, that each worshiper has, has to go through. Do you have any comment on that? Was that something that was discussed? Well, as we stressed, it's obviously absolutely critical in our view that all sides uphold the status quo regarding the administration of the Haram al-Sharif Temple Mount and take affirmative steps to prevent provocations and uh, incitement. We appreciate the Prime Minister's commitment to uphold the status quo. Um, we'll see what happens. I know that that step was referenced and reported, but obviously it hasn't happened at this point in time. Okay, so you would discourage them from doing so? I think it got, obviously the status quo does not include that. Uh, did we end up on this topic or a new topic? Okay. Jan, I'm from Northern Ireland. I have first-hand experience of construction being used to advance in a pol political agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, what your verbatim quote yesterday from uh, this podium was punitive demolitions are counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Now, if punitive demolitions are counterproductive, are punitive settlements counterproductive? Productive. Well, I don't know that we'd call them pu punitive, but settlements are counterproductive to the goal of achieving a two-state solution, absolutely, because it prejudges the borders, it creates tension, and that's one of the reasons we speak out uh, every time, unfortunately, there are announcements about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, any any more, on? more on this, or should we move on? Yeah, we go uh, go ahead. We going to, 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 to where? Sure, we can go back to ISIL. Okay. <laughs> so, so because no, we, we stopped in mid uh, Yes, mid bring us okay. back to ISIL. Yeah, I'll bring you back to, to ISIL. I, okay. I have a very quick question. Okay. Yesterday, uh, Chairman Dempsey uh, said, uh, he, he was talking about the cost of, of the fight against ISIL and so on, but he said something very interesting about Iraq. He said that we expect them to have an inclusive government, an inclusive participation of all parties. Otherwise, you are going to leave them, I'm paraphrasing, to their own volition, so to speak. Is there like a time limit to see how inclusive the Iraqi government is and is functioning and so on before you say, you know, that's it, we give up on you? I, I wouldn't, I don't think that's exactly what he said. I know you're paraphrasing I'm in paraphrasing. your own way, but yes. uh, I think one, we do think absolutely that it's very important that uh, not only do they govern in, govern in an inclusive way, uh, but that the Iraqi security forces um, are uh, inclusive in the way that they fight back against ISIL is inclusive. Now, Prime Minister Abadi has done a great deal of outreach uh, to the Sunni tribes. He's visited a number of regions to do that outreach. Uh, there was even um, uh, an event uh, just a couple of days ago, earlier this week, uh, at the Al-Assad Air Base, um, where uh, the speaker uh, made rep reference to weapons and supplies uh, that tribal fighters will be provided. So certainly, just uh, the proof is in what happens, of course, as is true in any scenario, but we have seen them uh, attempt to do a great deal of outreach. We've been doing a great deal of outreach through General Allen, through Ambassador McGurk, and we do feel that's an important part of how uh, things will be uh, effective moving forward. Okay, seeing how the Sunni tribes were felt alienated or, you know, felt abandoned. As a matter of fact, after the Americans left uh, Iraq and their pay was cut off and so on, and everybody's talking about some sort of a national guard that will bring in the Sunni tribes. Is there any movement in that direction? Has any, uh, has there been any progress, let's say, uh, in that area? Well, I, I just mentioned the fact that uh, Prime Minister uh, Abadi, uh, he visited Sunni uh, tribal leaders in Amman and Baghdad and stressed in public remarks that he will advocate for all Iraqis. We're in the implementation stage. They are of the National Guard program, but obviously beyond that, it's also about incorporating and including uh, people from many different uh, backgrounds into the uh, ISF uh, forces. Are you unsatisfied with his efforts so far on uh, bringing the leaders of the... We, we've seen him uh, take a, a number of, uh, make a number of steps, take a number of steps, I should say, uh, as well as people within the Iraqi government to be more inclusive. Obviously, this is something that they'll have to continue to work hard at implementing. There's a great deal of mistrust, as we all know, and it's going to take some time to incorporate everyone uh, back in together. Go ahead. Uh, General Allen yesterday and today, I think, is in Europe, and then tomorrow mm -hmm. is going to Abu Dhabi. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any readout of what his what is the purpose of his uh, visit? I believe he was just flying there yesterday and may have had some internal meetings in uh, France. I expect I'll have more either over the weekend or on Monday. 
So the other question related to somehow to Syria, because it's this ISIL issue, not the case that it's the administration is reviewing the policy towards the ISIL and Syria and the presence of Assad. The issue of uh, that UN commissioner to, to Syria, he kind of, the media in the region is talking about a plan or an action plan that he is trying to put in, in, in place in Aleppo, and consequently it's going to be a transitional period. So it's a political solution for what's going on in Syria. You're Do you referring have anything? to De Mistura's proposal yes. about the um, uh, uh, local ceasefires. Yes. Uh, I spoke to this a little bit over the past couple of days, and what we conveyed is that obviously if this is something that President Assad, uh, Assad uh, agrees to or actually takes real steps toward, that that would uh, be a completely different approach from uh, the months and months of brutality that he's instilled upon his people. Uh, we've seen local ceasefires be attempted in the past. They have not uh, worked out in quite the way that they had been planned at the outset of them. We'll see what happens. We certainly commend uh, Minister uh, De Mistura for his efforts, and we support his effort to achieve a political solution. So you 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 support his effort? Do you ask, do you how do you react to this? I mean, I, you are. In your mentioning, you are talking about the past, that Assad or he was acting uh, he, different, uh, the same way, but it, with it, the same result. So do you really, let's say, not appreciate, at least uh, give a hand to the uh, Demostora or the UN? Uh, well, I, I think I, the reason I mentioned the past and why it's relevant in this particular case is because there have been attempts at local ceasefires before, um, and we would need to see, the international community would see, need to see considerably more than just words to, uh, to uh, demonstrate a general, genuine interest on the regime's part in moving this forward so in a productive way. The idea why I'm asking, because it seems that the, the UN commissioner is visiting Cairo and other places and meeting people and some media reports saying that there is some different capitals in the region, they are presenting or let's say uh, reacting to this proposal or whatever action plan, I don't know how to call it. Do you consider it's a good step or a positive step, or or I'm not trying to evaluate it sure. more than we of to see if we are going ceasefires that would provide genuine relief to uh, Syrian civilians and are consistent with humanitarian principles. But obviously, everybody needs to go into this with their eyes so wide open. My last question regarding this: So, do you still do you believe? that there is a still possibility for a political solution or it has to be solved militarily? We continue to believe that their only solution is a political solution. Mm -hmm. Do you think Ambassador de Mistura is wasting his time? I didn't say that at all. I said we support his efforts. He's been uh, running point and working uh, quite hard as we've seen him travel all around the region. And we certainly support his efforts to pursue a political process, to pursue these ceasefires, and any effort that would bring relief to the Syrian people. Uh, we just all are aware of what has happened in the past when these ceasefires have been attempted. Do you think this is a very basic question? Why is there a political solution? Why, why, why is Syria has to? Why is there only a political solution to Syria when there is only a military solution to ISIS? Well, we don't believe there's only a military solution to ISIS either, so. So you're willing to, 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 to negotiate with them? No, no. Uh, right. but we believe so. there's many other important components and that it's hardly just a military approach to ISIS. Right. Can I ask a, a tangential question to um, Iraq and mm -hmm. Syria? And that is Tur it has to do with Turkey. The, okay. The, um, I just want to know if there was any, con if you are aware of any conversations you had with the Turks about the incident involving the sailors and whether you're satisfied with the Turkish response. Is there anything that you would like them to see? Do you think that these, um, what the Navy called thugs, should be prosecuted? And if, if you do, has it, have you seen any movement toward that end since they were sure. all caught on um, film? We are satisfied that the Turkish uh, government is taking this incident seriously. Uh, the Turkish Foreign Ministry, the Turkish Interior Minister, and the Turkish Ambassador to the United States have all issued statements condemning the incident, and prosecutors are currently pursuing a criminal investigation of those suspected in the assault. Uh, we've certainly been very close touch, in cl very close touch with Turkish authorities on the ground through our embassy. And do you know, have you, because <clears throat> these uh, sailors were, were targeted 
uh, because they were Americans for this uh, abuse and attack. Has there been any, ha have you uh, increased security or told your diplomats who are stationed in Istanbul and Ankara and at your other consulate, which Adana, I think, um, to be, you know, extra vigilant? We haven't put out a new travel advisory, which, as you know, we typically do if there's new information that needs to be put. No, but, I mean, th th these guys were, I mean, they were sold. They're, they're military. Sure. And they were official mm -hmm. American uh, people, as uh, unlike uh, a tourist, say, who might be there. But, and, and your diplomats are officials as well. Yes. So you're not aware of any Changes to caution our instructions? To, to diplomats and others who work not, at the Not embassies. that I'm aware of, Matt. Right. Right. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, Chairman Dempsey's comments yesterday that he can envision, um, paraphrasing, that he can envision contingencies in which U.S. troops would accompany Iraqi troops. Um, is there a disconnect at all between the DOD's desire to preserve options for the battle and the administration's stance that no ground troops will be sent at all to Iraq? Well, Chairman Dempsey also made clear in his testimony that he has not made that recommendation. And he also stated that he does not see a scenario when it would be in our interest to take this fight on ourselves with a large military contingent. So it was obviously a large hearing, but he was consistent with our view, which is that, yes, there are challenges on the ground. Yes, there's a need to uh, continue to train and support um, and build up the Iraqi security forces. But obviously, uh, the president will make any decision, and the chairman hasn't even made a recommendation. Sure. I mean, he was talking about the, you know, the future, but he didn't explicitly rule it out. And he did say that, you know, for example, the fight to retake Mosul could be a situation where the Iraqi army would have difficulty on their own, which might require some close support from the U.S. But do you not agree that that is any, that there's any kind of gap there between you, what you and um, if you Josh look Ernest at the said. full context of his entire remarks, he also made clear that uh, he doesn't see a scenario where we would get uh, more engaged with a larger military contingent. So yes, he was having a dialogue with members of Congress, and certainly that's part of what happens in any testimony. But uh, you know, the fact is the president makes the decision anyway. So. Uh, said yesterday they're sending uh, prosecutors to Balkans and uh, uh, North Africa and, and Mid East to deal with the uh, people who are coming from uh, Syria. They're part of the ISIL, they are now coming to home countries. And uh, Mr. Holder said that they are doing that with, uh, in cooperation with the State Department, the Bureau of Counterterrorism. They, they mentioned four Balkans countries, and uh, do you have any comment on that, and how do that, and what is behind that? I don't think I have anything to add to what um, Secretary Holder said. Obviously, part, sorry, Attorney General Holder, thank you, it's a Friday afternoon. Um, Attorney General Holder said um, yesterday, uh, obviously part of our efforts is to crack down on foreign fighters from Western countries, including the United States, that's something we're working not only with other countries in the world on, but also through the interagency, and there's a, certainly a role justice plays in that. But how come that uh, any embassy here from Balkans countries and anybody in those countries, uh, uh, I don't know, Justice Departments in Bosnia, Serbia, Croatia, Kosovo, uh, they have no idea what is going on. They never heard of that action. Well, we're working with a range of countries um, who are a part of the coalition uh, and talking about all five lines of effort, of which cracking down on foreign fighters is one of them. But I don't have anything to read out for you in terms of why individuals at embassies uh, would be informed but or not. Also governments in, in those countries, they, they don't know anything about that. I, I don't have anything more for you on this. Thank you. Sure. Based on what uh, uh, Attorney General Holder said yesterday, mm -hmm. Did the, the State Department get in touch with the governments of the four Balkan countries on this initiative? I don't have any more details on it. I can so check and see if there's so more. So you don't know if or not? I said I don't have any more details on it. I will let you know if there's more we can share. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yesterday you took a dim view uh, of uh, the Russian announcement that they were going to be flying uh, long-range mm -hmm. patrols in the, into around here. But uh, I'm wondering if you have, and you said that you didn't think the security situation warranted. I'm wondering if you have any comment, if you have any objections to the Russians who are now having a military drill with the Serbs in Serbia. Do you have anything on that, or is that? 
something that you don't have. I don't have anything specific on that, Matt. I can right. follow up with our Euro team, European right. team so if you'd like. Keeping on the um, Russia and Ukraine theme, um, one, have you seen anything new in terms of evidence of the, you know, the, of the uh, Russian incursion, the uh, Russian sending troops in? I don't have any new it. updates on that. There w um, there's a photograph that Russian television news is putting out. Apparently, it's been it's been all over the place today in 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 Moscow and elsewhere that purports to show a Ukrainian fighter jet firing a missile at MH17. Do you have any reason to believe that this is? Uh, a fake picture, a fake satellite photo, or have you seen it at all? And if not, can I you haven't look into seen it? the photo. I can check with our team and see if we have any analysis of that. And certainly, right. I would point you to those who are leading the investigation, of course, as well. All right. Another thing, somewhat related to this, is that the Russians say the secretary spoke with for Mr. Lavrov again today. Is that correct? Uh, he was supposed to, and I didn't get a readout of that, I believe. But and we can get you one after the briefing. The plan was certainly to talk about. Um, the Iran ongoing uh, P5 plus 1 right. negotiations the as well as the situation in Ukraine. But okay. The, uh, the, Go ahead. the Russian readout of, of the call, mm -hmm. of presuming that it is, I mean, it's dated today, so I assume the call sure. was today and that this did happen, but uh, it did mention all of those things, the Iran talks, Ukraine. But it also mentioned that Foreign Minister, that Foreign Minister Lavrov was upset that, uh, or that Russia, that he expressed to the Secretary that Russia is unhappy with the pace of the MH17 investigation. Which, which the Russians say is is not proceeding according to the Security Council resolution that and they and ICAO um, uh, guidelines. Do you share that view, or do you have anything? Uh, I don't more believe to say we about share that? that view. I would also think it's important to note that it was delayed for quite some time in the beginning mm -hmm. because of the fact that the Russian-backed separatists did not allow access to the site uh, to the investigators uh, to to gather the information and the. The proof that they needed. Okay, and then on. Well, I'll let someone else go. Okay, go ahead, Lala. One on Afghanistan. Sure. The Afghanistan president is currently visiting visiting Pakistan. Do you have anything on this? How do you see? Uh, well, we welcome the prospect of improved cooperation uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan, and certainly a trip there, a visit, an opportunity to have dialogue is a good opportunity for that. Also, the Pakistan Army Chief is visiting the city next week. Is anyone from the district? Visiting the Washington, D.C.? Yeah. The Pakistan Army Chief, you yes, said? Yes, yeah. Is, I, oh, go ahead. Is Sorry. anyone from the building planning to meet him? Why don't we check for you uh, and okay. see if there's any meetings scheduled next week? Go ahead. Follow on Afghanistan? Sure. Uh, Madam, what, what, will, what U.S. wants uh, India's role in the new Afghanistan since India has invested billions of dollars in the past as for the construction and other things and security. What will be the role, you think? Well, uh, India has been an important partner in Afghanistan. We've uh, been in close touch uh, over the course not just of the last few months, but over the course of the last few years, and we'll certainly continue to coordinate with them as we work to help Afghanistan maintain the, uh, the progress they've made on certain areas moving forward after we remove our troops. Thank you. Sure. In the reports that North Korea will be sending a senior official to Russia for a week-long visit and uh, giving comment on uh, We have seen uh, those reports. Um, uh, we, of course, maintain a regular contact and have consultations with Russia on issues related to North Korea. We closely coordinate uh, with um, Russia as well as many partners uh, to um, address the global threat posed by North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile programs. I don't have any other further details on the visit, but we don't have a concern from our end. No concern, though, that, that closer ties between North Korea and Russia could make it difficult for the U.S. and uh, other countries to pressure North Korea and the U.N. Security Council? Uh, I don't think we have that concern. We're in close contact with Russia about our concerns and their concerns about North Korea's aspirations. Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you see, saw the reports today that Boko Haram has apparently seized uh, the town in the north of Chibuk where these girls were from. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if you had a reaction to that. And um, it sort of further shows how difficult or the, the situation is and how really the Nigerian army really isn't managing to take control of it at all. 
Well, we are aware of the report, uh, and while we're closely monitoring it, we don't have confirmation of all the specifics that have been out there. Uh, we condemn uh, these attacks uh, in a Chewbacca community that has already suffered too much. Our condolences go out to the families of the victims. We remain committed to helping the government of Nigeria address the threat posed by extremist organizations and to assist assisting Nigeria and its neighbors, uh, Cameroon, Chad, uh, and Chad, to address critical security needs. We have provided, as you know, a range of assistance uh, to the government uh, over the course that I outlined, I think, just a couple of days ago uh, in the form of everything from military equipment to ISR. We continue to work very closely with them um, on addressing this threat. Are the um, American military advisors still on the ground? They were sent out to the back end of April to specifically sure. to try and find these girls. Uh, given that the girls haven't been found, are they still there? Or I it? believe there is still a presence there. I don't have the exact specifics on, on the numbers on that front. Thank you. Can we stay in that front? Sure. Um, there are officials in Somalia that are saying that you, uh, the, that the administration has threatened to withhold aid, several millions of dollars worth of aid, uh, unless basically they get their act together politically. Um, I'm just wondering if that's correct. I know you put a statement out earlier in the week mm -hmm. talking about, uh, well, expressing your unhappiness with the fact that the, they can't seem to get along and also saying that you did not see the utility in this conference that's mm -hmm. happening and that you're mm -hmm. not going to go. But I'm just wondering if that was accompanied by have they been told that they risk losing U.S. assistance unless they play nice? Shape up. Uh, let me talk to our Africa team. Uh, beyond the statement we put out a couple of days ago, I haven't received an update on this particular issue. Can I, I have another <coughs> Africa question? Actually. Sure. Um, this time about Equatorial Guinea and mm -hmm. um, what I would call football. Okay. You would call soccer. Oh, okay. <laughs> football, soccer, we'll yeah, call it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so the Africa Cup of Nations has been moved from Morocco, um, which asked for a postponement due to the Ebola situation and was not granted it. So it's now going to be held in Equatorial Guinea mm -hmm. um, next year sometime. I just wondered if uh, from this building you had a view about what, how appropriate it would be to hold what is a, quite a premier um, football event in a country where there have been serious concerns about uh, corruption and human rights abuses. It's a, I'll take the question. Okay. I'm happy to. I've seen the reports, but I haven't discussed uh, with our team whether there's a particular view, concerns, et cetera, from our end about where they'll host your, the soccer, your, your role soccer in football. The Confederation, the African Federation football is what? None. There is none. Not is it, none. Does, does the State Department or the United States government have any interest at all in where this event is held? And there, it's a serious question because you do have sometimes concerns or views about certain events. We and if you're going to take that question, I'd like to ask you about the World Cup and gutter. All right, Matt, we've spoken to that, that one, one quite extensively to the degree we have a desire to speak well, to you it. Well, you actually but have a team. You ha actually have a team that yes. plays sometimes in the World Cup, which is a bit different than until, unless you have a team in the African Cup. We do not, but I believe what Joe was asking me, and we may or may not have a comment on this, was about particularly reports of corruption and concerns right. yeah. about that as it relates right. to them hosting a major sporting event. Yeah. Okay. And do you have any concerns? No, never mind. We don't have a team to announce for this. That's well, not I changing. mean, you know, maybe you have an idea of where the Asian Games should take place next yeah. time they have it or, you know. We'll see, Matt. We try to be responsive when we can. Go ahead. Jan, a question again on Nigeria. Mm -hmm. uh, President uh, Goodluck Jonathan announced uh, a few days ago his intention to seek re-election. Was there any U.S. response to that? And secondly, uh, on the subject of locating the missing girls who have been missing now for a very long time, uh, is the U.S. still actively involved in the search to locate those girls? Uh, we are actively involved. Um, we I talked about a little, a few couple of days ago, obviously we're very closely involved with the government of Nigeria in taking on the threat of Boko Haram. Yes. We had shared uh, surveillance capabilities several months ago. Uh, we've also provided um, a range of military equipment that I talked about a few days ago. Um, in terms of the first, tell me again your first question, I'm sorry. Any comment on the uh, statement that um, President Goodluck Jonathan is seeking re-election? I don't think we have any particular comment from here. Uh, go ahead. East Timor? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe Monday was the last time. Madison case. Do you have any update on that? And have you um, been given any clarification on what the evidence is against her when charges might be filed? Uh, I have a little bit of an update um, on this. So let me just talk through uh, that. Um, 
One, um, we uh, saw uh, Dr. Addison uh, three times on the week of her rearrest and visited her most recently on November 10th, so, so just earlier this week. Um, our understanding is that Dr. Addison is currently being detained as a witness to a crime. Uh, we're currently trying to verify if charges have been filed against Dr. Addison um, by, the uh, by the government. Um, we understand there are questions uh, as to whether there is any evidence linking her to these allegations, and we have uh, requested that the legal process be expedited. So you also said on Monday that um, state officials had raised um, the case in meetings with the East Timorese ambassador last Friday, mm -hmm. um, that you received assurances that U.S. concerns would be raised at the highest level. Um, have you received any word that they had been raised at those levels? Do you get the, the sense that the government there is addressing those concerns? And then also, um, is it are you have you expressed further concerns about the fact that if she's being detained as, as a witness as opposed to necessarily as somebody who's committed a crime, is that something that you've raised separately? Well, uh, we have raised questions about uh, whether there's any evidence linking her to these allegations. So we've certainly raised that, and that's a more recent development. We had that meeting a couple of days ago that I spoke to. I don't have any new updates for you other than to convey that we remain in a dialogue um, with officials on the ground there about this particular case, and we, of course, remain in close touch with her as well. Go ahead. Uh, oh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I wanted to know if you had the answer to my question yesterday about Russia's um, decision to limit its effort in securing the Sure. Country. Thank you. Um, well, um, a couple of updates on this. Uh, program, on a pro program, programmatic, sorry, tongue twister. On a programmatic level, uh, we're still uh, working uh, closely together. Uh, we believe that there is still very important uh, work to do uh, for the United States, for Russia, and for the world, and we remain ready to work uh, with Russia. We haven't received any official notica notification from Russia about canceling nuclear security cooperation, and of course we continue to believe that we have a shared interest and a shared responsibility in promoting nuclear security, uh, and we have a long established uh, partnership with Russia on a broad range of activities designed to prevent the spread of WMD by securing and eliminating WMD uh, related materials and technology. Uh, we also have um, agreed and have in place a new framework for nuclear security cooperation uh, uh, which replace um, the Nunn Luger uh, CTR umbrella agreement as a mechanism for continuing to conduct nu nuclear security activities of mutual interest that kind of takes place in a third uh, country. So there's a range of work that's continuing um, on the working level. Uh, and again, we haven't received official notification uh, in this regard. But wait, wait, you haven't received official notification in what regard? Related to, as she was asking about reports about canceling nuclear security cooperation well, for 2015. Yeah, but you have gotten an official notification that they're not going to take place, take part in the nuclear security summit, right? Well, that's one component. Right. That, that's not the entire component uh, of understood. work that's done behind the scenes. Uh, I understand that. Mm -hmm. But you have gotten formal notice that they are not going to participate in the in the, in this summit. So it's not entirely true, is it, that, that you haven't gotten any formal notification that they're not? Well, a formal notification related to them not participating at all in any effort to. Right. I think the question, though, the question that was raised yesterday and that you're answering today refers to one specific program. No, I think it refers to cooperation in the general effort, and it was a it news story that published yesterday. It refers to story in the New York Times, right? Right which was about a, a program, but you say that you haven't gotten any formal notification, but in fact the Russians have formally notified you that they're not going to take part in the summit, which writ large is nuclear security related, right? Yes, and is one component, but right. there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. So, so you're saying, okay, so you're saying that, that, that you haven't gotten any formal notification that the Russians are not going to cooperate on, well, across the board? Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. Elliot, did you have something? Or no. did I, you, you were kind of... Dancing or moving your arms. Just pondering. <laughs> okay, pondering. Go ahead, Joe. One more on Hungary, and I don't know, you, okay. may, you may want to take this. Um, the Hungarian Prime Minister today, Viktor Orban, is saying that his government has received uh, a document from the United States which uh, sets out what he calls a loose collection of accusations. This relates to the visa lifting, mm -hmm. which goes back to last month. And apparently it raises concerns about VAT fraud, institutionalized corruption, whistleblower protection, um, 
um, and so on. I just wondered if you could confirm that the United States has handed over such a document, and if so, what's in it? I, we're not going to speak to or comment on private diplomatic um, co communication. Uh, we, of course, have a dialogue with the Hungarian government um, at many levels on a wide range of issues, including the fight against uh, corruption. And obviously, uh, as you know, we've spoken to re the recent decision to uh, apply uh, Presidential Proclamation 7750 to current and former Hungarian officials, which of course is related to the visa bans, et cetera. So there was a document that was handed over. You just did not get, you can confirm that. You're not just, you're just not going to tell us what's in it. I'm not going to confirm details of how we communicated or what we communicated, but obviously we have a dialogue about corruption uh, and our concerns about that issue, among others, um, with the Hungarian government. We're just not going to speak to it in more detail. Well, when, um, when this came up last week, or the last time it came up, mm -hmm. I thought you said that you were going to, that the, that, that the Hungarian government had raised, had asked questions about it, and that you were going to respond through diplomatic channels. Is that not Well, but my that can happen through dialogue. Wrong? That can happen through a means of um, communication. I don't, I will see if there's more to confirm. I doubt there's more we have to say on this. Well, I guess I just don't understand what, what do you mean? It can happen through dialogue or a means of communication? You mean? There's a range of ways we can answer questions. What? That's what I was getting at. Mm. Uh, so the head of the tax office, the Hungarian tax office, um, who is called Ildiko Vida, has actually outed herself as one of mm -hmm. these people who's on the, um, on the list. Um, could you confirm that since she said that she is? Yes, and she's to put, put her name out there, yes. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. I think we have to wrap this up. Thanks, everyone.